It gives a sense of how this impedes the reopening trade and don't forget, I mean, this is not a, an up, a, a straight line, certainly. And how does it affect the way you look at, uh, at stocks in China's equities and just markets generally? A lot of interest, but uh, people aren't really, uh, you know, following it with deeds. This is the problem. Well, they're, they're not diving in yet because there have been so many false dawns. But, uh, I mean, it's always good to look at what's happened in other markets, the trends you see there. And second and third quarter in the West, when we had the lockdowns ease, we had substantial increases in economic growth. You, you know, China's obviously gone through a bad patch, but I think we have to assume that China's also now going to see a real resurgence of growth. Um, and, of course, a lot of people are saying that, well, maybe President Xi will uh, appear to be proved right because we will see growth coming out of COVID. And, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the declaration of victory will go along that. So, yes, I am reasonably positive on China on a tactical basis. But I also think Hong Kong's interesting. I think Hong Kong could be a leveraged play on this China move because uh, so many people want to get into Hong Kong. A lot of the top businessmen uh, work here. Some of them live here. Uh, and I think Hong Kong will benefit especially because of that. But... You are also saying that markets, and we're not going away from China, generally are a little bit uh, passive, sanguine, I think is the word, the word that you used here. And, that you, and, and what really surprised me, you said that bonds are dead money. Well, I, I mean, markets are uh, in a real state of flux at the moment. We've got quite high inflation. Uh, and yet we've got interest rates that don't seem to be able to catch up. That's terrible for bonds because you're not going to get the yields on it you necessarily want, and yet your money is degrading all the time. Um, if I was going to look at three tactical moves at the moment, it would be China, uh, it would be stay in the US dollar because if we do see uh, problems in the global markets, you want to be there, um, and it would be equities. Uh, careful with equities, of course, because you need to be careful with your uh, selections, uh, but I think equities are still a better bet than bonds at the moment. Uh, Richard, some say that you buy China on cheap valuations. Is it also now time to look at China in terms of fundamentals? You talk about growth coming back. Can we buy China on the basis of both valuations and fundamentals as well? I think fundamentals are extremely difficult with China at the moment because we don't really know what kind of figures are coming out. It's difficult to get anecdotal evidence for what's happening because at the moment it's quite difficult to travel into China. You can't go and see factories. You can't go and see what stock they've got. Uh, you can't um, uh, interview management uh, particularly well. So it is difficult to look at China on fundamentals. I think uh, basically you have to look at chi uh, China in terms of why would you buy China? Well, you probably want to buy China for things like electric vehicles. You probably want to buy China for its tech because they're very good at tech. You might want to look at one or two exporters, although they may be subject to issues from global slowdowns. So I think China is a market where you have to be selective. You have to look at particular areas. And with every investor in a country, you have to look at what's China going to be good at, not necessarily just looking at China as a whole. For 2023, one of the big questions will be whether we see a hard or soft landing, whether we see a recession. When you take a look at the dollar and you take a look at the bond market, what are they telling you? Well, the, the bond market, I, the reason I said I think markets are quite sanguine is because I don't think they're really building in the true impact of what we're seeing with inflation. And also what we're seeing with inflation is things like labour conflicts. We're seeing uh, strikes in the US, strikes in the UK, threats of strikes in Europe. You know, these are all big issues that are likely to keep inflation stubbornly high. That means the Fed and other central banks are going to have to control that by putting interest rates up. Now, we've had a, a bit of a hiatus recently, a bit of a bump because the Fed said it's going to reduce its stages from 75 basis points to 50. But we still could get a series of 50 basis points happening on a fairly continual basis in order to fight inflation. Um, inflation's insidious. Once it gets uh, its hooks into an economy, it's very difficult to get it out. Uh, and we saw in the Volcker years that it took uh, very high interest rates, well into the double digits, for that actually to happen. Yeah, you know, what was it, it worse than your, uh, 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 I can't remember the, the Reagan quote on this anyway, but I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but you are suggesting that, and I think you, could, you call it, uh, you know, not vaingloriously at all, naturally, the, uh, the Harris law of quarterly reversal. 
Okay, what is that? And haven't we had a bad time of it already in many of these markets, especially developed ones, in December or now? Well, actually, we've talked about this before. I know. It's extraordinary how, uh, at the end of a quarter, maybe just before the end, maybe just after the end, we do get these reversals. Now, we've had a pretty good quarter, all in all, in the fourth quarter. Um, the news coming out isn't particularly good, so I think there's probably quite a good chance that uh, the early part, the early uh, week or so of the new year, we could see a reversal, and that reversal is likely to be negative. Um, in fact, we saw it last year, January the 2nd, I think, was the, the high of the markets. Uh, and since then, the market's pretty well gone down. I think we're looking at pretty well 20% now. You know, it's a, it's a bear market in the year. Now, uh, students of history will say that you don't often get a bad year after a bad year. Uh, but, of course, uh, you know, this time it's different. All generalizations uh, are false. Uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, it, it's quite feasible that, um, uh, that we may get another bad year again. The fundamentals are not good. And I think the Fed are fighting against the tape. Fundamentals, not good. We could get another bad year. Big question here, Richard. How do you hedge? Well, it's very difficult to hedge. You know, you can't run, you can't hide, uh, you can't run deep. Um, but I think basically you have to uh, look at your portfolios uh, in terms of risk. You, you know, investors these days at the moment are risk managers. You've got to be an active investor. You can't just invest in indices because they're probably going to stay flat for a long time, uh, go down, go up, but probably stay flat for a long time. So again, I think if you're looking at equities, you need to look actively. You need to look at companies that have pricing power. Uh, that can uh, companies like Staples, where they can increase prices a little bit day by day, a penny or two a day, people don't notice. Um, and I think that's the thing with uh, inflation, that's the thing with these kind of companies, that you have to focus on the ones that are doing that. Richard, I want to get a sense here. I mean, you're doing a PhD, and we all know that news fundamentally moves markets. I mean, that's <laughs> exactly... But you've been doing a deep dive into this, into this subject, which we all seemingly know about, and you... <laughs> been uncovering a lot of stuff. T give us a sense of, very quickly. I mean, I know it's a, it is a PhD and you can't just do it in, in a very parsimonious way. Well, I'd like to think I could. Uh, it's called narrative finance. It's how uh, stories move markets. And I mean, you're a great purveyor of stories and uh, Bloomberg uh, moves markets because uh, that's why it's there. The thing is, it's been very rarely researched in a proper way. What we're really looking at is how does that narrative signal? You have a shock event. How does it move through the market? How do you classify those different areas? areas of the signal. And the important thing to an investor comes down to the question you ask, often ask me, is this news in the market? Well, what I'm trying to do is find, by analysing the narrative signal, how much of the news is in the market. Should investors just sit on their hands or should they take action? So it's as simple as that. The answer's in the stories. Richard, before we let you go, we have an M Live question for you. What present, what present, what gift are traders expecting? I didn't quite catch that. What the traders expecting? What is the gift oh, that equity gift traders would like presents? for Christmas? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess it's uh, economic growth, uh, stratospheric, Fed interest rates down to zero, um, and, the, uh, and the fairy comes to visit. Um, it's tough to see there are any free gifts this Christmas. I think basically we're all going to be looking at a piece of coal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, press, you can press coal enough. And I'm a half full kind of guy most of the time. Well, you're not today. And, uh, if yeah. you, but if you can press coal enough, you get a diamond. So there you go. Oh, good point. Right? Good point. And the In quote time. Was, yeah. In time. And the Reagan quote was, inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. Richard uh, Harris. Excellent. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Port Shelter Investment Management CEO.